Hey, everybody, welcome into the Sports Fanatic News Sportscast as we're here for our second episode as I am joined by the wonderful Steel Flyers yet again as we're here to talk about the four major sports. As baseball is getting set to kick off a season in a couple weeks, basketball is yeah. coming off of its all-star break, uh, heading into its second half, and hockey's uh, rounding about towards the end of a short and 56-game uh, stretch. And um, also, of course, we'll talk about some football and the recent signees, which I think become official tomorrow. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the 17th. Kicks off. Yeah. yeah, so that will be, isn't today the 16th? Yeah, yep. so that will today become 16th. official tomorrow, which is when this show, I believe, we're going to premiere tomorrow evening, correct? Yeah, so that will be when everything's official and you guys have them inked in and you know they're officially on your right. squad. <laughs> yeah, but we'll get we'll get into we'll give that. you a little bit of a preview. Yeah, of a preview. Yeah, but we'll get into that later. First and <clears> foremost, <throat> how you doing today, Steel? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. Uh, love doing the show here. Um, this is going to be awesome. We got a lot of stuff to get into. How you doing, Joe? Doing well, doing well. It's always great to talk about some sports, especially when uh, we're going to start off with hockey and really be able to get into a lot of streaks that many teams are on it even in our division you got a uh, pittsburgh at winning six i six. believe it would be. Yep, yeah six. now uh washington's at five and the isles are at nine um and then we're at that sweet one game winning streak you know against the yeah. um but we can start we can start <laughs> with uh the flyers division uh since it's our very own and the flyers are falling back as other guys are marching forward um what do you think when it comes to Pittsburgh we'll start with and work our way up has allowed them to finally get churning in the right direction at least in these last six games and number two do you think those will those traits that they found in these last six will last and be able to keep them in the playoff race man I'll tell you what they just seem to be putting it together real well right now you know what I mean so I if they keep doing what they're doing then then they can be okay you know what I'm saying? But that that's what I think is going to be the problem. If if they suddenly start to slide and they don't put some of those wins together like they've been doing, their defense has actually been stepping up and playing well. Their offense, obviously, we all know the offense that they have. You know what I'm saying? So it's one of those things where if they if they suddenly find themselves on the bad side of things, then it could potentially go south. But to be honest with you, man – both their goaltenders have been playing pretty decent. I mean, DeSmith has been playing well. Yari's been playing well. And then, you know, the, you, you've got all that offensive power, and you've, you're seeing the defenses stepping up a little bit. And they're not giving up as much, and they're, they're playing a little better. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, and all that goes a long way. I think it's going to contribute to – if some guys that have been performing well towards the bottom tier of the lineup, like the Teddy Blue years, uh, Brandon Tanev has been performing pretty solidly just here, and Kapanen's really stepped up for them since coming Boy, back. has he. If those guys continue to perform, they'll be able to carry it forward. If they don't, uh, you'll probably get exposed some of their defensive woes again. But of late in this six-game stretch, all of a sudden the CC and uh, Matheson line, who... Right. Uh, both guys that have struggled a lot at points of their career, now both at 27 years of age, has really also stepped up and done bigger things. And Marcus Pedersen's kind of stabilized himself. Chad Ruedel's still kind of a journeyman that fills in well at time. So they, I could still see them looking to add maybe one more guy there or just recall up Olivier Joseph just because that made absolutely no darn sense to send him down in the first place. But <laughs> you... uh on a six-game winning streak now, it should be pretty easy to integrate another good defenseman. So yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I think they're definitely moving in the right direction, but it's what you said. Can they keep um, basically the defense staying steady as well, combined with what I said, they need guys to continue to perform down in the lineup and not and, just And you know what else, too, Matt? You know what else? They need to stay healthy, too. 
You know, if, yeah. if any of those guys suddenly go down with an injury or something, then they don't they don't really have the the people to put in place to replace those guys. They've had a couple guys step yeah, up. Yeah, but or because McCann and Zucker went well, out. And okay, that's but why the Lafferty's and uh, yeah. Stevers and Angelos and all those guys are getting more time and playing all right, and then Jankowski obviously has stepped up for them. This right, year. right, right, right. Agreed, agreed. I, I, what I've been really been impressed with is the Islanders is their streak. I mean, they've garnered um, 22 of the last 24 points. Yeah, yeah and have a nine-game streak. Yeah. I mean, I, I just went, uh, uh, yeah, I guess you're going to lead uh, the, the division. They're leading the, what are they, top of the NHL right now? Or is that is that um, uh, the team that has 42 points, which would be Florida? Uh, Florida's top of the NHL. Florida. Yeah, they're tied in points. But one of the one of the differentiating categories okay. puts the yeah. And who would have thunk? Who would have thunk? Florida. I mean, who would have yeah, thunk Florida? Cool. I mean, the Islanders are really helped by the fact, and all three of these teams that really put together streaks are because they've really been outscoring their opponents of late. Pittsburgh pulled their goal differential up to a plus thirteen, wow. uh, which is tied with Washington's. Okay. Um, and then the That's Islanders is all the way up at a plus 22. So wow. they've really been outscoring their opponents when they got 22 of those 24 points like you brought up. And they're also led by one of the best coaches, obviously, in Barry Trotz and run by a guy that's in the Hall of Fame in Lou Lamorello. So yep. you got a pretty good squad to run <laughs> and put together your squad. Um, you think? So I think. They, they uh, seem pretty team- stacked. What do you think? Yeah, I think all their team is lacking, like I said, and I don't really like to insult people, but he just isn't good anymore. Leo Kamarov should not be playing 15 games. But other than him, you have a pretty solid lineup, and then he just sticks out like a sore thumb. (laughs) So like, that's why I'm saying you might want to fix that. So (laughs) you could get one forward, and then you would be good, or you could hope Del Colley, who was supposed to be great, finally figures it out at the NHL level. Uh, or Anders Lee comes back a little that's bit. That's the other thing, too, that's really hurt the Islanders. Um, but And I think we're going to see that more so down the road than we are going to see maybe in the first couple games. But I think you're going to see that affect the uh, Islanders a little bit. But, you know, who knows? We'll see. They they do got Barry Trotz. I mean, he's one of the best coaches in the league. And, and he's – I mean, they just have been – Riding that wave, I mean, you know, so uh, until it until it's broken, I guess they're they're not going to worry about it. And they're just going to yeah. keep riding it, you know. Well, they got a very high graded defensive line too. When Pelic and Puyak are together, one's a plus eleven, the other's a plus yeah. Uh, both <laughs> of those guys work really well. So that exactly. that um is a big sign moving forward. They brought in a veteran in Letty who's worked out a pretty solidly since going there. And then uh, Andy Green, the wise old graybeard veteran of a former devil. Um, well, well, you got something against graybeards. He's Islanders. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he's doing really well, still playing yeah. over 17 minutes a night. So yeah. I'm with you. Um, I'm they with you. really put together this uh, team pretty well. And then Ajo, the other Sebastian Ajo, played his first game of the season with 10 minutes the other day and still hasn't fully figured it out at the NHL level, but there's still time. He's only 25. Because um, the one that so, plays for Carolina is doing pretty good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Oshoff, I wouldn't be surprised. He played a game at the NHL. He didn't do as well in his first game, but as a prospect, if he maybe comes up, the guy they got from Toronto – yeah. out of Ukraine just because he's oh, yeah. he's already he's closer to being ready where some of their other guys are not really fully ready or they could bring back up lad but then you're bringing up 5.5 of cap exactly uh, so exactly. you have some options a veteran in lad or you could bring up to mosh off and then you can go from there and you might not have to sign or trade for a forward that's right. available so now here's 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 one for you. Now I got I got one for you. Now we're approaching half. We're about everybody. Pretty much most of the part, for most part, everybody's at halfway. Uh, as far as the uh, NHL season, there's just a couple of teams that are a little bit past that because they've obviously played more games. And then there's a couple of teams that aren't quite there yet because they missed 
games due to COVID and or whatever the case is. But so <clears throat> at this point in time of the year now, we're starting to see teams separate themselves a little bit. You know what I mean? And you're starting to see that gap is starting to open up where you're starting to see the teams like Florida, Chicago and Tampa Bay and Carolina are separating themselves from the rest of the team in the division. You're starting to see teams like uh, the Islanders and Washington and Pittsburgh are starting to separate themselves from the rest of them. You know what I mean? It just seems like it's at that time of the year now. So my question to you is this, all those teams that are, you know, all the teams that make it and everything like that, are you more interested in seeing those interdivisional playoff games? Or are you more interested in seeing the ones where uh, you start seeing like Boston play Toronto or you start seeing the intermingling of the divisions for the playoffs? Out of division because we saw so many interdivision games this year already. So I want to see how each team shakes up out of division uh, when they're playing opponents they haven't seen this year compared to guys they've seen over a handful of times this year already. So I would definitely say uh, out of division for that. But we do have one more team we got to talk about in our East division for being on a win streak as much as uh, – we hate to talk about our own division having win streaks that doesn't involve the Flyers. Um, that would be the Capitals, who um, now all of a sudden, again, they have two goalies since Sam Sonos come back and started performing better. They're on a five-game win streak. Um, they're performing well on all cylinders. They obviously have a very consistent power play that's pretty much been doing the same thing for the last 12 years. Um, <laughs> and, and pretty much every but, time Ovechkin steps out on the ice, it's a new record. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But what do you think has um, led to the Capitals' success? And do you think because of their experience yeah. and also having Lavi, who usually does very well in his first season, there be a team that's very likely to keep this up and make it into the playoff. Yeah, I think they are. I, I think we, we looked at this team at the beginning of the year and said, man, Lavi is going to be good for this team because he's going to, he has, he just has an affinity with being able to coach guys for that first year. And especially with a team full of veterans like the Washington capitals are, I mean, you know, look, let's face it. Oh, she's been playing really well. Their goaltending has been playing really well. Their defense has stepped up. Okay, uh, their their uh, offense is always going to be there as long as they have Ovechkin out there on the ice, and they're getting it more from just Ovechkin. Like he's not the only guy that's scoring. You know what I mean? You're getting it from elsewhere. You're getting that secondary and and you know not always just Ovechkin is responsible for putting the points on the board. You know what I'm saying? So those points are coming from other places. And so that's why I think you're seeing Washington taking off like they are, because it's it's not just like, oh, well, if you shut down Ovechkin, then that's it. Well, no. If you shut down Ovechkin, they got, you know, four or five other guys on the team that, you know, another couple of lines that are going to be able to take care of the scoring. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, and their defense has really stepped up, too. Uh, Brandon Dillon's been very good for them defensively this year and has also produced eight points. Yep. Carlson is 24 in 28 yeah. game. Uh, Justin Schultz has been great for them this year. And so has and Chara. Then, Chara's played really yeah, well for yeah, them, too. Chara, yeah, Chara's really good, especially for the age of 43, mixing in with Nick Jensen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Jensen, <laughs> having Jensen come back and now look uh, – very solid himself and scoring two goals against the Flyers. Um, so they seem to have a pretty good squad. Uh, you obviously have Vanacek's played the handful of games because Sam Sonoff was out with COVID. He's back right. now and seems to be getting in his groove. So that's going to send them yeah, in the Vanacek right direction. Yeah, but played really well. He played really, really well that time that Sam Sonoff has been out and missed all that time. He played really well. No, yeah, exactly. But I'm saying now with Sam Sonoff back, they're even in a much better spot. <laughs> <Yeah. game. laughs> More they dangerous team now. The only reason they're playing with one less forward is because Tom Wilson got suspended. So when he right. comes back, you're not going to play with the extra defenseman where TVR is in a lot. And then yeah. you have the forward core go back to the way it was since Lars yeah. Elwer is also injured at the more most unfortunate of times. So. Right. And how many games? He was suspended for, what, seven games? Seven years. Seven games. And he, his suspension should be coming up here soon, right? I think um, after. Yeah, I'm not sure how many games he has. Okay, sure. all right. I haven't paid attention to it yet. Okay, but it should be soon, though. 
I mean, seven games, that's like a week now in the NHL. <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah, the lot. way things are and everything like that, seven days goes by. You've already played four games, so, you know. <laughs> It'll probably be four or three more games max, I would think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And then but, if we but go, that's going to be okay. like that's going to be like a free agent for them dropping into their mm-hmm. lineup after seven games. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, it's going to be like, oh, hey, now this guy's now going to be part of the Washington Capitals again. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that there's going to I I think we're going to see some things happen at the trade deadline this year, uh, more so than what we did last year. Um, obviously owing to the fact of what, you know, they had to change it and move it and all that other stuff from last year. So the other thing I think, too, is that we might see some moves sooner than the trade deadline because of the logistics with um, the COVID and dealing with going back and forth to Canada. So you might see some of these deals being done sooner. You know what I mean? Because they have that 10-day or 14-day rest period or quarantine period that they have to go through. So... I really think this is going to be a very, very interesting trade deadline where you're going to see some of the teams that are on the fringe going to be trying to do what they can to get there. Yeah, I could see that. If it involves Canada, I could see it happening earlier. If it involves America, there's not as much of a reason to have to push right. for it to happen as early. Um, so, Or if it involves two Canadian teams, there's not as much of a reason to have to push for it to happen as early if you're trying to get the best deal. Exactly. Um, so... I think I could see that if it's between a Canadian and American team. Otherwise, my advice would be like it normally would be, which is don't rush it. Try to get the best deal for both of your teams. Agreed. Um, but we have a couple other teams that we will get to that are also on winning streaks. Two are in our central division. Uh, we have the Carolina Hurricanes. Uh, led by Rod Brindamore, former flyer, on an eight-game winning streak. Um, what do you attribute other than Rod Brindamore and the fact that their stars are really uh, being able to step up for them to the Carolina Hurricane success? What's something you think is really contributing to their success? And do you think they're a team, especially now having, I believe it's 41 points, yeah, 41 points on the season this far that have set themselves ahead enough to prove they're definitely one of this year's playoff teams? To the to be at twenty six and one right now for the Carolina, uh, we had a lot of question marks with Carolina because of their suspect suspect goaltending, because um, Talbot was not the most consistent, uh, and Mar- or I'm sorry, Morazic was not the Reimer most consistent. Reimer and Morazic were not the most consistent um, goaltenders. Okay. And there was some injuries, and then they had some COVID and everything else like that. But I'll tell you what. I would not want to play Carolina as the first round of team that I would have to face in the playoffs outside of this division. I would not want to play Carolina because they are scary good. They've got consistency. They've got – they you know, they're good on the power play. They're good on the penalty kill. They're good in transition. They make good, crisp passes. They're, They're in shape. I mean, you know, Rod Brindamore, come on. You know those guys are in shape. Yeah. <laughs> you know Yeah, and everybody that's integrated into the lineup, Jake Bean's been very good in his first 17 games. Flaherty's I'm, looked uh, yeah. all right. He's more just a defensive guy. He's a guy you want to get a little bit more out of Hayden Flaherty. Pesce's looked good. Shea's looked uh, the most offensive he's ever looked, not putting up as much offensive numbers, but he's been touted for his defense by Brindy this year. Yep. And then Hamilton and Slavin looks like a good pair. So they got Trocek out now, but are still doing solid. Gardner's out, who was performing pretty solid in 17 this year. So yeah. they got a couple guys out, and they're still performing well. I would say this team's definitely set themselves ahead enough to definitely prove they're one of the playoff team for sure this year that are going to bring mean business and also they're going to get arrested Mrazic who sometimes burns out who's barely played this year who was coming off of a great four game start back yeah. it's almost like a free agent pickup of their own whenever <laughs> he does come back so right. Right, what right, right, now right. happened to Delkovic and, and then Reimer's performing what he has to and Delkovic is performing well so you have two guys that are getting the job done and then a healthy rested Mirazic coming back so exactly and that look at 41 points okay 
they are still, let's see. Uh, they're, so there's a, a, a two-way tie. Islanders have 42. Florida has 42. Then the next team is 41 with Carolina. Then you have Tampa Bay, Washington, uh, and Toronto have 40. And then the next one is Vegas at 39. They're leading their division at 30 with 39 points. So yeah. Carolina is actually you know, third best team in the league right now. Exactly. That's why they clearly set their bounds to be a play a proven playoff team for this year. So did the team you mentioned second. Tampa Bay is going to make it, and they have one of the biggest comebackers coming back when it comes to their team, which would be Kucherov. Um, so if you have arrested Ooh. Kucherov, come back to a team that's already – one of the better performing teams of the league this year, uh, that's really going to bring some inroads and uh, really scare some teams coming into the playoffs. I mean, they didn't get to have that last year because Stamkos played for most of the year, but then he was out for the whole time they were in the bubble, and he, he actually missed the last part Except of the for season. five minutes of which he scored a goal. Uh, two minutes yeah. and 34 seconds yeah. <laughs> for that shift that he played. Right, I get you. But what I'm saying, though, is that he even missed, like, the, the last, like, what, couple weeks of the season because of his injury, you know, and then almost in the entire playoffs and most of all of the uh, Stanley Cup, they were without him, and they were still able to perform at a very high level. Now, the, the exact opposite, uh, the exact reverse happened to them this year where Stamkos was in healthy, but Kucherov went out. You know what I mean? And, and 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 he was hurt. So now they've been playing this well with Stamkos in. Imagine when he comes back. Holy, now they got two guys. Yep, exactly. Yeah, they got the biggest free agency acquisition via their own teammate that was out injury-wise <laughs> uh, coming back. Um, but to wrap, to wrap um, this up with the NHL Central Division, we have to talk about the best team in hockey right now, which is the Panthers, who are on a four-game uh, winning streak of their own. Who would have thunk uh, at the beginning of the season that at this point of the season we would be talking about the Florida Panthers being number one, not in their division only, but in the entire NHL at this point in time? Wow. Um, where Frank Vetrano, I think, was on like a six-game goal streak or something like that. The yeah. dude was going off lately. Um, they've really been performing well. Every star on their team has stepped up. So what do you think, other than Bobrovsky, who's starting to step up now, uh, what do you think has gone to their success and the fact that this team's the best team in the league and by far the biggest surprise team, I would say, of this year's NHL season? Well, one of the things that I think has really helped – Florida this year was being in the central. Yeah. Be yeah. Uh, okay. Because let's face it, the, the bottom, the bottom of the central is some of the worst teams in the league. You got Detroit with eight wins, Dallas with nine wins, Nashville with 12 and Columbus with 11. You see what I'm saying? So I think that's helping them that they're being able to play those teams and beat those teams. But not only are they beating those teams, but they're beating the Carolinas and the Tampa Bays and the Chicagos, right? So we all thought that if Florida, if if Bob could play up to 80% of his Vesna self, we felt that Florida might sniff at one of the playoff spots. You know what I mean? Um, apparently the co-host disagrees. <laughs> but they have just completely overperformed. This year, um, Quinville's got them rolling. You know what I mean? He, he's got that team playing in a good system. Everybody's bought in. OK, and everybody's playing for one another. You watch these games. You, I re, a couple weeks ago, I remember watching Huberto make the sick uh, behind the back. No look spin a rim, a pass right to, to, to get a goal for another teammate. Yandel has stepped up big time. You know what I mean? So the guys on their team have really stepped up and played exceptionally well. I Judas think being has in, also been a good uh, enforcer for them. That's exactly a plus this year. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Gudis has played well. I think that this team 
could potentially win this. I mean, they could potentially win the Central if they keep on keeping on. They're they're definitely. I mean, Tampa Bay is now in third place. Carolina's in second. I mean, they only got uh, two points ahead and one game. Tampa Bay and Carolina each have a game in hand, but Carolina is one point back and Tampa Bay is two points back. Yeah, it seems like for the top spot, it's a battle between those three. And then Chicago can, if they continue to perform, keep pulling ahead as the fourth team. Yeah. Where it seems like they're going to make it as the fourth team. Like they would like have it. to get on a big streak of their own, like a six game run, in order to get back up to where Florida, Carolina, and Tampa are at the 40s, where they're at a 33 uh, point spot right now. Uh, because they lost a couple in a row as Carolina yeah. and Florida won a handful in a row, and Tampa right. only lost one recently. So. Right, and Columbus uh, won a game or two there. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, before yeah. losing their last game. Yeah. yeah. So that brought them a little bit closer. But uh, um, Central ahead. is one of the most – look, everybody thought that, you know, oh, this is going to be – but all these divisions have really kind of shown the, the top teams. And – with a more you know a little less than halfway through the rest of the season here we're going to see some interesting things and one of the things that i think that we need to point out is this if you look at pittsburgh uh, even though we originally picked them to not do much this year and look at where they are right now uh of their remaining 20 some odd games half of them are against buffalo and New Jersey. Yeah. For the remaining for the remainder of the year. So if Pittsburgh continues to play well and continues to win, they're gonna their schedule is gonna come to them. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. And, and to where they could potentially overtake. But they gotta keep it rolling. If they get hurt or they don't keep it rolling, then 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 no. Yeah, they can be the biggest benefactors of their schedule. I would say one division that hasn't really showed his hand on the top team because they fell off after taking a bigger lead is the North. Because Toronto took a bigger lead, now they don't have that big of a lead. They only have a four-point lead between Edmonton and Winnipeg, who uh, got hot themselves after starting pretty poorly. So... Um, and then if you look all the way down to the sixth spot in that division, there's only a three-point separation between the four spot. The only team that seems like they're truly out of it in R is Ottawa. So yeah. other than them, there's every other division has kind of showed its hand, or at least their upper two. This yeah. one really hasn't shown its hand much on anything other than the fact that Edmonton is a little bit inconsistent where if Winnipeg stays hot, they might be more consistently there with Toronto. But other than that being the potential of foreseeing, it hasn't really shown its hand to much yet, where I think Montreal is still going to be a little bit behind because they're going all defensive. They're not going to be able to catch up points-wise when they're already um, 33-40 to 40 right now uh, for Toronto. When the, they'll be in the playoffs, I think, have the best chance to make it if they can defend. Because if you can defend the Canucks and Flames, you can take advantage of their defenses at okay. times. So okay. I feel we'll like that's, that's going to be they have a better yeah. advantage there. Um, but you know, this decision I don't think is decided yet. This is yeah. the one that I don't think is decided fully by even who's in the top three at this point. Like, I would also have to say that I would put the West in there too. Because the West is so tight right now. I mean, you got you got a four points between first and second place, but then you have less than two points separating the next three teams. Yeah, the only team that's truly – and the Sharks are pretty much out of it too, but that's truly yeah. out of it is the Ducks just Ducks. because they're at 22 to 33, where 25 to 33 could still be made up with a win streak. It's just not likely. Exactly. Um, 28 to 33 for both the Kings and the Coyotes still puts them in it though. Um, exactly. So, yeah, that division's definitely uh, close, and it's going to be interesting to see where that goes. I would just have to lean towards of experience – the Vegas Golden Knights being able to hang on because they have the most experience since bringing guys over, which sounds weird since they're a team that's only six years old. Um, but um, 
they do have more winning experience than some of these other teams, other like than Minnesota, Colorado, who yeah, who does have some winning experience in St. Louis, who won the cup, cup obviously recently, yeah. but they've changed more than Vegas too. St. Louis lost Pietrangelo, was a big part of that cup winning team, brought in Krug, a different type guy. So St. Louis has changed. been hurt a lot this year too. Yeah, they've been hurt a lot. So it's even it's very um. Nice to see they were able to contend and stay where they're at. I just feel this year they need to get another goaltender, too, to rest Pennington so he doesn't get beat by the playoffs. That's why I don't think they're in my contending status now for the Cup. If I'm picking someone from the West, that would be Vegas. And then Minnesota would be a sleeper team for the Cup, but I wouldn't put them in my contending status yet. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I I could agree with that. I mean, I really like how Minnesota's been playing as of late. You know what I mean? Zuccarello's really got that team rolling, and 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 they've been playing really well. But it it just seems like <clears throat> this is going to be one of those divisions where I agree with you on that 100. percent I think they're right there with the same kind of thing as what the uh, North is doing, where maybe the top two, maybe three teams, still haven't quite really established themselves yet they they kind of jumped out a little bit and then now the other teams are starting to catch up you know what i mean like with what happened with toronto you know what i'm saying so well uh, go ahead i was gonna say with the north though i think even though toronto winnipeg and edmonton edmonton's gonna need their defense to get a heck of a lot more consistent uh yeah. and not just have mike smith step up because that's I, I mean he's been doing great and hats off to him shout outs to him but i don't think that's gonna last forever <laughs> i then, agree i agree uh you have winnipeg who rides off the back of hellbuck and mixing in great defensive games they need to get more consistent there are a lot of running guns same with edmonton same with toronto the only team that's committing to defense is montreal for the most part, like well, I think kidding. Calgary is now too, man. Because they're going to try to, yeah, yeah. they're going to try to. We'll see how their group is able to actually integrate that, since they were not in that form at all before they were running a complete right, 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 right. Set, where Montreal was a little bit more steady to convert. Yeah, to I got you. More defense, but. I feel like Montreal also has the catch to do it a little bit more. Like you have the veteran like Petrie, you have Weber, both are pretty good defensive anchors. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, but I, there, if there's a team in Canada that will surprise to make a deep run, that's probably Montreal because the other teams are running gun. You have teams in other divisions, once they play out of their division, that are a lot more defensive than Toronto, Edmonton, or Winnipeg. So if they go up against someone that can all of a sudden stop their stars, they're going to go, well, what the hell do we do now? So that's that's going to be what could happen for those teams. Where Montreal, you might have two to one scores, <laughs> three to two scores. Exactly. These teams, you might have five to six scores, six to five, seven six, because that's how some of their games have been. So yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, all you have to do is look at their goals for. I mean, Edmonton has one hundred and three goals for. Toronto has one hundred and two. The next closest one is Washington at a hundred. Okay. Yeah. That- that's that's the next close. The next one closest to that is Florida at ninety nine. Tampa Bay is at ninety eight. Uh, that's it. I mean, you don't even have the Vegas is not even cracked ninety. Yeah, you know what I mean. Now, so you can, yeah. Now, just to wrap up on hockey, and then we can, uh, if you want to run the ad, do that and move yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Next topic. Um, I would say for our division right now, as much as it pains me to say it, the Islanders are the best contender for the Cup. Um, And then if we go into the Central, I would say it's Florida and Carolina with Tampa being an outlier because Kucherov's come back. But when he comes back, you need him to get into a groove quickly. It's not like you he might come yeah. back like Marshan, but not everyone comes back and snaps it right away. So you have to I see. Got you. If he is that guy or if he's more like a Giroux, who other than this year when he came back, usually takes a little bit to come back. So you have to see what he brings. A team to watch out for, though, is Chicago as a surprise team to make a deep run because Doc, if you go deeper, will he be able to come back sooner? Will Taze all of a sudden go, oh, I feel better now, and uh, we wish him well and hope everything that's going good with him, but... Maybe whatever his illness is, he fears COVID is the biggest thing. So when I don't know that, but if that is the case, a lot of vaccines are supposed to be out by the playoffs. So if that does stay on track, 
he might feel more comfortable by the postseason if it's not something with his muscles and it's more a health concern that he's very scared of COVID, if that's actually the case, he might feel comfortable by postseason's time. Well, if you get Jonathan Tays back in your lineup, that that's a big thing, too. So Gee, that's, that, why, that's an automatic uh, game changer right there. Yeah, so that's why you have to watch out for Chi-Town and see how their guys are coming back. Even Nylander, who has a lot of skill, if he comes back and is able to put it together because he's going to have all that fire in his belly being out for a while, wanting to really step back in and show what he's worth, that could even be a big uh, contributor. Yeah. So that's why yeah. I would say they're a sleeper team. But I would say, if, unless if you have any closing points, that wraps up the NHL topics I wanted to talk about. Yeah, no, the only thing I could say is um, I, I think you're going to see some teams that are going to surprise you. I think, honestly, I think Pittsburgh's going to be one of those teams. I also think Minnesota could potentially be one of those teams. And I agree, I think Chicago could be too. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think Minnesota's more of a sleeper team than Pitt just because Yari has to continuously show me he can do this where Talbot stepped up at times in the past and was kind of just run into a ground similarly to, <laughs> similarly to what um, San Jose's doing to Martin Jones. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, so I think that's a little bit different there, but that's just my take on it. No, I agree with you 100% on that. Where Cockadin looks like he's going to step up for uh, Minnesota if he yeah. continues to uh, perform as well. They lost Staylock to Edmonton. I know, but, uh, yeah, but it looks like yeah, he, yeah, he's looking like a, a really good player, too, for them. I'm, uh, quite amazing. And Jones in their system coming up to play goaltender. So. We would like to uh, throw this to our sponsors. We'd like to thank uh, www.cccresorts.com. Um, proud sponsor of the Steel Flyers All Sports Network. Proud sponsor of the Sports Fanatic News. Um, they uh, take care of all of your pet daycare needs. They have uh, groomers there, professional groomers. Uh, they have an indoor and an outdoor pool. And we're going to catch a little commercial here and let you guys hear what all they have to offer. And thank you very much for CCC Resorts for being our sponsor. You can talk. Oh, okay. Now, how should I do this with the Skype recording? Just stop it and patch it all together later? Or... If you want to just let it keep running and then just, or if you want, whatever you want to do. Don't don't stop it. Just let it keep rolling. Okay. Because if you stop it, then it messes things up on my side. All right. Well, in that case, how long is the commercial? Three minutes and 46 seconds. Okay, because if it's going to keep running and recording on mine, we should have some commercial topic just to talk about till it's over. So it still doesn't just doesn't sound like we're having a random conversation. Um, but you know what? Let let me. Uh, I'm trying to think here. I might be able to send you the file. It might take forever. But I might be able to send you the file. Okay. Okay. Like that'll it'll have a commercial in it. It just won't have the opening music or any of that other stuff. It'll just have the commercial. It'll just be like you know. What I yeah. Mean? Well, it doesn't matter how long it takes because you put it out first anyway. So. Yeah, you can always fine. download it and capture it off of YouTube, with OBS. Like seriously, dude. All you have to do is capture it. It's a it's a display capture. In, in your stream labs and you just run the show and hit record on your stream labs and it'll record it. That's how I was able to get your movie. Oh, uh, well, okay. I'll have to see if I, I don't really know how to do that, but I'll have to see. That's all right. It's all good. So the commercial runs for three minutes and 46 seconds and then I, I mute our microphones. Um, we can't we can't hear the commercial, but it's running, I, I promise. <laughs> and then as soon as the commercial's over, then I put our microphones back on and we're good. Okay. But yeah, man, that's what I would do if I were you, dude. I would just 
wait until I put it up there and then just capture it. That way you can capture the music, the graphics, all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Okay, yeah, I'll try to figure out how to do that then. It's actually pretty easy. Like I said, man, you just open up OBS, Streamlabs, and do a display capture and make sure that the Yeah, but how do I get it to display capture the video, though? You're, you're, you're pulling the display capture from the, the video that you're watching on YouTube, on your screen. The display capture you're getting is on your screen for YouTube. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I guess, did we want to do um, basketball next and then go into football and closer baseball? Whatever you want to do next, man. Yeah, we can do basketball next. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That was a word from our sponsor, www.cccresorts.com. We appreciate them sponsoring the show. Um, all of the uh, great stuff that they provide for your pets, daycare, uh, swimming pool, all kinds of wonderful things. Steel Flyers Dog is enrolled in this program. And and uh, I'll tell you what, they take care of Steel Flyers Dog so well that she loves going there. So uh, And she comes home every night, sleeps. So <laughs> that's always a good thing. You know what I mean? So. All right, my man. We, we we took care of the hockey side of things. Uh, yeah. Let's get let's get into some hoops, right? We we just we just yeah. finished the uh, All Star game, and how did that go off? Um, to tell you the truth, I didn't give a crap, so I didn't watch any of it. I don't care about All Star games as much as other people. I just, All right, I, I was I, just I, curious. Yeah, I, I like I like the the festivities around it but like right if there's the game better, is like yeah, yeah, yeah if there's something better to watch on television i'm not gonna watch okay. a sports all-star game i used to always watch baseballs because it had a contributing factor in home field advantage for the world series but right. now that that's not the case that's not even important anymore okay so, okay okay uh, well, this that's was why, just like, kind of more of a yeah yeah this was just more it's of just, a it's just a dunk contest almost. It's just all offense running up and down. So where okay. hockey's just a scoring fest and baseball's just like a run competition more times than not. So okay, all right, I got you. They pull the World Series anchor off of it. So okay, okay, but I tell you what though, man, we've got a lot of stuff going on here, and a lot of teams are jockeying for position uh, to try to make the playoffs. Uh, I'm assuming, and you, you know, here's a, here's one of the things. That I have to be real honest with you about that I was completely blown away by when when I saw this the the first time that I saw this and this was a couple of weeks ago and I was blown away by the fact that the Sixers were leading the East and they still are they're actually second in the league yeah the first team in the league right now is Utah with twenty eight and ten yeah um, and the Sixers are twenty seven and twelve. And Phoenix of all teams are twenty six and twelve as a third in the league. Um, so and then you have the Nets at twenty seven and thirteen. Yeah, the Nets are more <clears> to be expected though. After you get James Harden, when you have Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving already, that's a little expected I to mean, be. Tough. I mean, and and the Lakers yeah. aren't no slouch neither at twenty six and twelve. No, the Lakers just got screwed by <laughs> Anthony Davis's injury. That's what. That's what hurt the Lakers. They got completely screwed by Anthony Davis's injury. <laughs> you have yeah, one that... of the best players in the league get injured, and now you have LeBron at 36 having to carry a roster that doesn't have the most efficient, consistent scorers around him without right. Anthony Davis. So that's all that happened there. The Clippers realistically should be better than they are. They don't have like they they're only a couple games they're three and a half to two, but the Clippers realistically should not be letting Phoenix show right now that they're as much of a contender for mm. the NBA Finals just yeah. by looking at statistics and not looking into all the players. If you look into all the players and roster, I would still obviously say Clippers are more of a contender for the Finals based off of experience and pedigree and guys in their locker room. But right. if you just look off of stats... Phoenix is right there with them. With the guys okay. you have compared to the young upcoming team of Phoenix, 
for at least the time being, you still should have performed better than them. Where I would say they're a team that's performing around expectations, but still for me has been a little disappointing this year because I wanted to see more consistency from them. I would ra- I always wanted them to be the team that was showing the Lakers that they could eventually pass them. Where this year they're not necessarily showing the Jazz or Phoenix that they could necessarily pass them, yeah, which are. Yeah. The reason I wanted to lead into them were they're the two surprises teams in the NBA. You got the Jazz taking over the West still at two games above Phoenix, who all of a sudden is starting to come up big in the West and is eight and two in their last ten. The Jazz are only five and five at five hundred, and both the Lakers and Clippers are four and six. The Nuggets are actually coming on their tail now since they're seven and three, only two games back in their yeah. last ten. So. The Nuggets are a scary team. If they get into their team, you don't want to. We saw what they did last year. If you let them in, they're a scary uh, opponent. But this, these surprise teams, it's, it's been exciting to watch Phoenix and Utah just continue to perform. And teams that are supposed to be young and not there yet, using that mentality of, oh, really? We're not there yet? We're show you. Yeah, right. Being the two <laughs> best in the division. Like, what do you what what do you contribute to that? Do you think it's all just having that underdog mentality that's thriving these teams? It could or it's be. a combination of great roster structure and having that underdog mentality? You know, what's really amazing is that, you know, when we looked at the West, everybody was like, oh, well, you know, Lakers and LeBron and AD, right? And then you looked at the Clippers with Kawhi Leonard, you know, and thought, okay, uh, you know, these are going to be the teams that are going to come out of the West. And, well, no, they're, they're not. Right now, apparently, uh, yeah. you know, the, the the younger guys see. Look, I'm always about those younger guys showing up and putting it down and 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 going through and doing what they got to do because it makes all those other guys around all those other teams, like the older teams, the guys that have the experience and the vets, look around and go, "Wow, look at them young guys really going." Well, we better play good, or we're yeah. going to get our butts kicked. OK, and, and see, that's what I think is going on here. We're starting to see these young guys saying, yeah, well, we don't care if we're young. We're coming in here and we're still kicking your butt. You know what I mean? And so when you have a coach and an ownership that supports that and then you go out and put the players out on the court that are also playing into that system, that are also playing into that mentality. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I think they're doing really well. And and, and I. I would not be surprised at all to see them there at the big dance. No, I mean, with if you look at Phoenix, they have put together a good team. And I think a guy that's really come in, you have Booker, who's a great young player, averaging over 25 points. Um, you have guys, you brought in a guy like uh, Mikel Bridges, who is good on defense, athletic, shooting great from three this year, too, over 40%, averaging over 13 um, Sarek is a nice little bench pickup, a scrappy player that brings a lot of energy, a former Sixer draftee. And then DeAndre Aiden defends the rim with the best of them, averages a double-double and still gets you over 14 points. But the solidifier for that Phoenix team is one of my favorite players that I've ever watched in the NBA, Yeah, which is Chris Paul. Who's I was just going to say great, Chris Paul. <laughs> who's also great on State Farm commercials. Um so, <laughs> Hall of Fame in both levels. Basketball, State Farm commercials. Right, um, I got you. I got you. But, I got you. Uh, the guy is a great facilitator even still at 35. Uh, he's averaging over 15, uh, eight and a half, or over eight and a half, 8.8 8 assists, and has looked very good out there still, and has still 39% from three when he shoots them. So, uh, he's a guy that really calms down a young roster and almost is that quarterback of a team. And I think when they brought him in, that's really what has made this team be able to be that great surprise team. They almost have a player coach since that's exactly what everyone knows. Chris Paul could be either in management or coaching. He's that brilliant with the game when he retires, they have a guy that still plays at a high level, but also almost coaches and mentors everyone around him and settles down the room. And that's what I think has really helped that team. And when you have a guy like that, I mean, that doesn't matter what sport you play on. Okay, you get a you get a veteran in there like that that knows how to calm the room down and knows how to be the leader of the young guys, knows how to take those younger guys under their wing and mentor them a little bit and 
show them what it's like to actually be a professional basketball player. You see what I'm saying? That that kind of a talent, that kind of a leadership, that kind of a person transcends sports. You you could yep. plug that guy into a hockey team. You could plug that guy into a football team or a baseball team. And there's teams that are littered with those types of guys. That's why you get teams that have those good mixes of young guys and some of those veterans that come in there and can take care of business like this. And that's what I think that Chris Paul has been able to do here for the Phoenix Suns. Yeah, and it's the similar um, facet with uh, the Utah Jazz because they have a guy who everyone says is kind of the mini Chris Paul when he's at his best in Michael Conley they brought over to Utah. So he now healthy is uh, producing at a very high level and almost putting up mini Chris Paul stats. He has the, that's why I said five and a half for Chris Paul. He has the five and a half assists and 16.4 points. He's a guy that really calms down your room and facilitates your offense well at the age of 33 in his mid thirties as well. That's been around the block and look how good it seems like he's really helping a player like Jordan Clarkson that almost averages 18 of uh, really coming to his own in his late twenties. They obviously have Donovan Mitchell, who's an all-star in the league, but Donovich is a guy they brought into the room. Who's great. They kept favors for his veteran presence. Yeah. This mm-hmm. team knew how to mix in the young with the old really well. And that's exactly what I think has gotten them to the point they're at now. They mixed in their vets with their young studs so well that that's why they've been able to take advantage of some injuries for both L.A. teams and some misfortunes and be in first place right now. I mean, you know, it, it's they're trying to get back to that level, you know, that they were in 2017 where they won the division. You know what I mean? So they're trying to get back to that level, and, and, and I think they're – they're, they're getting there, you know what I mean, with with being, what, they're top in the league right now, right, Utah Jazz? Utah, yeah, Utah's yeah. first, the 76ers so, are second, Phoenix. Now, I have a question for you now, okay, are they playing the full full season? Are they, are they playing um, all 70, eight? 72, I believe, or 73, oh, something like that. Okay, okay, so they're playing, they're playing 10 games light. Something like that, yeah. It's okay, because it's normally 82 games for a basketball season, mm-hmm. right? And they're playing 10 games late. Okay, all right. So here we go. I mean, this is where this is where the rubber meets the road. You know, these next couple of weeks are going to decide who's going to go and who's not going to go. They did expand the playoffs by, what, one team for each side to give a wild yeah, card Yeah, I, I believe that's what they did. Yeah, okay. So it's I, I think that uh, playoffs it, for the NBA this year are going to be um, probably a lot more exciting than what they were in recent years, I think. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a chance for that because you have a lot of teams that are going to be in close quarters. But I think um, now when it comes to other teams that have been successful, uh, we talked about the West. Uh, we can move now mm. – into the east and yeah. you have well yeah the sixers have been successful but you have the closest to them three teams have kind of set themselves apart by a bit in the east and that's the sixers brooklyn and milwaukee yep the heat are four games back of milwaukee in third place charlotte's four and a half and so is boston now who's okay. taking a step back yeah. uh the celtics have and they're only 20 and 18 now so um I think those three teams are going to be the three that are going to be at the top once the East is said and done, unless if Miami, who I would give the best chance to, can kind of get their veterans, Jimmy Butler, everybody kind of fine-tuned into the right order going. Yeah. When they get Kyle Lowry, and that kind of helps facilitate and calm down everything, just as we said Chris Paul did for right. Phoenix and Mike Conley did for Utah. But yeah. other than that, I don't see them for – overtaking Milwaukee and especially a Brooklyn or a 76ers team. The biggest contest to the Sixers, I would say, is Brooklyn, just because Brooklyn's offense is one of the most historic offenses. Milwaukee's a good team, but they will get inconsistent on offense at times when they don't make shots. Giannis will sometimes try to do some things he's not as sexy at doing. And then it'll be all hell breaking loose, and that's when they have the series like they had in the playoffs last year, and they're not able to kind of get over it because every issue kind of compounds into another issue, and then 
you don't get over the hump. The Sixers have had that issue in the past, including this season when Joel Embiid was out. Recently, they've been showing more success when guys have been out. And a big factor to that has been Ben Simmons, things that I have almost lost my voice for trying to preach on podcasts in the past, has finally got aggressive. It's only taken him about six years. But hey, he finally picked up the clue phone that you've been ringing for him. But now he moved his point total up. I think when we talked about this list, it was at 13 points. He's three points up at 16. Oh, wow. He's at 7.8 rebounds, 7.7 assists. He's bringing his stuff up. Now, there's still games that for some reason he'll take a back seat when he sees other guys around him having a bigger yeah, point yeah. up in that game which is just not what you're supposed to do as a star, but he looks more aggressive lately. And if he can keep building in that order, that would bring much success for the team. And the fact that um, Seth Curry um, can kind of go back to how he was. Uh, he had a 22 point ga- or 21 point game, excuse me, against Sacramento uh, or not Sacramento, San, An- San Antonio. And, um, that was his first game. He really locked in, but he had a 14-point game he looked good in against Washington beforehand. He seems, after battling COVID, to kind of be off after coming back, to be now coming back into his own. I was just going to say, because the biggest he, he, part of their yeah, because so. he went down last year with a, uh, was it, um, yeah, yeah. And so he wasn't, I mean, they were like, well, he's going to, whatever, you know. But so he's actually been able to be a factor this year. So that that bodes well for them. You know what I mean? One of the things, though, that I have to say is this. I really like what Brooklyn did with bringing in James Harding. Yeah. I, and, and, and pairing him up with Kyrie Irving. I mean, wow. Uh, I guess that's why they're pretty historic. What else is going on? Why? Why is the Brooklyn? I mean, obviously we know because of their offense and stuff like that, but are, are they also playing the backcourt as well? I mean, you know. Mm, they're like 23rd in defense or something like that. They're not a good defensive team. They brought their defense up from being like 28th a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. But they're, so it's kind of like a lot of different analysts have laid out. They only have to be decent at defense to get to the finals because it'll just outscore you the problem is if you have a team like the sixers are probably the best team in the east them or the bucks when it comes to matching defensively because they have guys that play good on both sides of the ball and some guys that are just kind of there for defense yeah to go up against brooklyn and be able to like like matisse thibel who the sixers have is fifth in the nba in steel so he might be able to create some havoc and wreak some havoc against the Brooklyn Nets. The Those are the only two teams in the East I would really pick out that can really flourish great on both ends. Because I would say the Heat based off of last year, but based off of this year, the Heat haven't been as consistent yeah. with that. So if they get more consistent, which they have time to do, then I would throw them into that group of a team that can kind of defend Brooklyn better than some people envision. But... The Celtics seem to be not doing that. Charlotte's not going to defend Brooklyn, so uh, that's that. That's no contest. Okay. okay. I think it, it's only really the Sixers, the teams of the division, that are going to be able to defend them. And then if they get to the finals, when AD's healthy, I would say the Lakers have the best. How long is he expected to miss? Oh, and he's supposed to be back. He could be back fairly soon. The problem is he's not going to be back. Like, he'll be back, but he won't be Anthony Davis because he's not going to be able to do all the cuts that AD does because he's going to be worried about doing what KD did. You don't want to go from having one injury to making it 50 times worse like Durant did by trying to push it. So I think it's going to be you're having back, but to what degree? And that's what's Well, then why why would you bring somebody back like that? Well – with KD, KD's a sharpshooter, so it made more. It made a little bit more sense with KD because he could have just shot. He injured it trying to do a little bit of things, and he didn't really do much. All he did was move a bit, and then he ended up screwing up his knee a little bit more. Anthony Davis is going to be a lot more interesting to watch because he's – I mean, he could shoot the three, but AD ain't a sharpshooter. So okay. 
he's going to be a guy that scores down low. He uses his body. It's going to be interesting to see how he adjusts his game. Like, if he becomes more Dirk-esque while he's injured or something. Like, what he does so he doesn't get into the bash areas and potentially mess up his career for next season okay. while trying to Yeah, that makes out. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that's sense. why it's going to be interesting. So if he's not fully there, I would honestly say if they keep playing the way they are now, um, I really do like their defensive rating is fifth in the league. I really do like the Suns to be a sleeper team if they can somehow be the sleeper team to make it all the way through the West to defend Brooklyn and kind of give them a challenge. I don't think they would necessarily beat Brooklyn because they're too young other than Chris Paul. But I think you could see the Suns push Brooklyn to six or even a seven-game championship. And that would be something nobody would have expected going into this season to see Phoenix, of all teams, push one of the most historic offenses in the history of basketball six to seven games. Yeah, so, right. I think uh, that's that's a team that you can look out for. Their defensive efficiency has been tremendous all year. DeAndre Aiden, as far as I'm concerned, because he's not as sexy on offense as some other centers, is one of the most underrated centers in basketball because he's that good at rebounding and just stopping guys coming in on the opponent. You do not want to drive the lane on DeAndre Aiden. You probably have a 10 to, depending how big you are, like at most right. a third percent success rate. So um, the that's what I think he's a very good defending center and going to become one of the best as time goes on defensively. He'll be a guy you want on your team defensively. He's never going to become a guy of Embiid or Jokic's level on both ends of the ball. Right. But he's right, right, a right. DeAndre okay. Jordan kind of s guy that just plays good defense and uh, gets it done for you. But um, those are the teams I would consider to be the top contenders for Brooklyn to go up against Brooklyn um, where Milwaukee and the Sixers and if Miami can pull, of course, have an advantage because they have the most tape of them. They've been playing. They're in their own conference. They've played them a little bit more. They have a little bit more feelers on them than the West who hasn't played them as much. But Okay. Uh, Wow. Uh, It's going to be interesting, um, especially with the adding of the new – uh, the wild card here for the playoffs. It's going to add a new little wrinkle. Uh, you know what I mean? And and you're looking at like the the Nets and the Sixers are are more than halfway now. They've they've both each played thirty, uh, forty games for the Nets and uh, thirty nine games for for the Sixers. You know what I mean? So there's there's only roughly you know about thirty games left. You know, for these guys, so this is where they're. This is where it's going to have to come together. Yeah, the only thing we have to see from the Sixers is they're away. You have to get more consistent. Um, they've been ten and nine to seventeen and three, so that's something. Yeah. Um, they would be probably far past the Jazz if they were actually consistent on the road. <laughs> the Jazz are twelve and eight, which is a little bit better than the Sixers. That's four games compared to yeah. only one above five hundred. Yeah, yeah, sixteen yeah. and two at home, um, which I believe is the best home record uh, in terms of win to losses. Uh, the Sixers have one more win, but have three losses. Um, so, I think that's something we have to look out for in the second half of the season. Can the Sixers become more consistent away? Because if they do that they could potentially be, especially if they add in one more shooter and then another anchoring defender type, a team that can be top in the East, especially, and potentially top overall, right behind the Jazz, by season's end. Yeah, I'm with you on that, for sure. So, well, here, here, going to be starting soon, right? Uh, Playoffs are going to be coming up here sooner than most people expect. You know what I mean? Time goes goes by much quicker. You know, are they playing a condensed schedule like the hockey is, or are they still just playing like a game every other day or every couple of days they play a game? Or you know, they, they kind of seem to have a little bit. They're moving uh, quicker still. Yeah, they, they had the All Star break, but they're still moving it pretty quick, even uh, with the All Star break. So the NBA has been doing a pretty good job with that. Okay. Okay. Um, 
So if we wanted to, like I did with hockey, I'll run through who I think will stand out, not just in the conference, but in the divisions real quick. I think when it comes to the Central, Milwaukee's pretty much won it already. Um, the Central Division, you have seven points, seven and a half, or seven games, seven and a half separating. Well, Chicago. they're eight no in their That's division, expected. too. So, yeah, they're <laughs> destroying the division. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, in terms of the Heat and Charlotte uh, and Atlanta, Atlanta has been really good lately. They're seven and three in the last 10, as well as Charlotte. Miami's been nine and one. The Heat have the most experience. I'm going to lean towards them due to having the experience and having guys that have won before to be able to take that division. But that one's by far the closest to call. Um, Utah, I think, is going to take the uh, Northwest. Yeah. Denver will be behind them probably, but Utah will be the one to take it. The Pacific is the hardest to pick. Um, I still think by season's end, they're only a half game back now. The Lakers will be able to win, and either Phoenix or the Clippers will be in second. Um, I don't think Phoenix Makes will sense. keep it up enough to win a division yeah. over a LeBron-led Lakers team. Um, the Especially when AD comes back and you know that kind of stuff, too. So, yeah, I'm with you. The Southwest um, has – the most mediocre teams in it, but uh, Dallas is 20 and 18. Uh, San Antonio is 20 and 16. Just because I want them to win the division, I'll give it to Dallas. Right. <laughs> I would rather see the San Antonio <laughs> so much in the past. Um, when it comes to our division, uh, Philadelphia and Brooklyn, uh, like I said, I think if the Sixers add that one more consistent shooter, because Milton's been a scorer, but not necessarily a consistent three-point guy. He's only around 30% this year. Right. You can help with that and another defender. I would lean towards the Sixers because they're better on both ends of the ball, where Brooklyn's historic offensively very meh defensively. So That, that is, by the way, a technical that. measuring term, meh. Yeah, exactly. Okay. With uh, Brooklyn being in a second uh, when it would come to that division and a very close second. So. Okay. All right. Uh, honestly, I'm with you on just about everything. I really do think that um, either L.A. Uh, Clippers or Lakers are going to take that. You know what I mean? Um, I, I don't know if Phoenix is going to be able to hold out. I also agree with you on all the other ones, too. I think Sixers, Milwaukee. Um, yeah, uh, Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to be interested to see how things are going to shake down in the playoffs. You know what I mean? That That's yeah. going to be the interesting thing for me. So. Yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, I'll tell you what. We got quite a round of NBA stuff talking about, didn't we? Yeah, we had a lot of stuff. I mean, there's been a lot of surprise teams. You have the Jazz and um Sons who have really yep. uh, come to their own this year. Yeah, man. You have a surprise in a fall off in Boston for how much they fell off after getting off to a solid start. Right. They had some injuries and so on and so forth, <clears> but they've always been a team that's battled through everything. That's why, to me, it's still surprising since Boston's always had that team that found a way to get through whatever. Exactly. Um, so I would say, yeah, I mean, this has been a great um, – show to get into a lot of the NBA stuff is rendering the second half in terms of a surprise um, team to look out for, as I gave some in hockey, other than just Phoenix with how hot Denver is now, I would say you have to look out for them just because of the scorers on their team and how much trouble they were last year in the postseason, <laughs> um, what they might be able to do with an extra year now under their belt, especially gotcha. when everyone comes back. So, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, man. Uh, great, great hockey talk, great NBA talk, but, man, we, we got to – I think we have to hike a ball here. National Football League here, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, get into some NFL. There's been a lot of different NFL news about signees and um, different people going different places. Um, the Bears um, are continuing to confuse people when it comes to their quarterback room. Um, they've apparently just gave Andy Dalton ten million for one year after already having Nick Foles and uh, complimenting Mitch Trubinsky at the end of last season when he actually got going a little bit. So. Um, which is another guy. It'll be interesting to see where Mitch goes. Um, but yeah, you have, he's obviously not going to be. 
No, he's obviously not going to. Well, if the Bears sign him, then they're really confusing people. Um, but Dalton and Foles are very similar. They're pocket-passing quarterbacks that can air it out, kind of do similar things. So it makes sense, I guess, for the uh, premise yeah. that you have two similar guys. I was just going to say, usually yeah. usually in today's game, you see teams kind of have want to switch it up a bit between the starter and backup, so it kind of brings in a different vibe. So the defense is thrown off. More like, yeah, you saw yeah. Luck and Brissett. Andrew Luck and Jacoby Brissett are nothing. Okay, yeah, similar. I'm with you. When you have Deshaun Watson, he was never with another runner as his backup. It was always like Matt Schaub or somebody that was a passer. Just right. like a straight up more like Matt Barkley was a backup for that team for many years. He's yeah. obviously nothing close to Deshaun Watson or nothing close. Val, val, well, one value wise, but two play wise. Well, like what, what they did Watson. down in New Orleans. Yeah. What they did down in New Orleans with Drew Brees and then uh, number seven. Yeah. Right, because he's he's a more of a running quarterback and more of a you know athlete, whereas Drew B Drew Brees is dropping back and throwing the ball. Well, not anymore though. Um, by the way, um, congratulations to Mr. Drew Brees on 20 years uh, in the NFL. So, congratulations on your retirement, my man. Uh, hope it's good and it didn't take him long. And boy, he landed a job at NBC as an analyst. <laughs> I think yeah. two days after he announced his retirement. He came out and announced that he was going to be working for NBC. All right. <laughs> so, today oh, yeah, was the yeah, start yeah. They were rumored. Of, yeah, today they, was the start of free agency. Yeah. Today was the start of free agency, and the league year starts tomorrow, the 17th. So, all of these trades and everything are uh, subject to league approval. Uh, that we're going to talk about today. So nothing's really signed quite quote unquote in stone as of yet, because until the new league year starts is when they can actually sign these contracts. Um, the other thing that's going to be starting up to is the naming of the um, franchise tags. They will have to come out soon as well, because they have to be on a deadline before they can to, to try to sign to get a long-term deal or they stay on the franchise tag. So those will be announced real soon. Um, the I believe the salary cap went up a couple million. Yeah, they said theirs still is going up. That's the one league that actually still brought up, went up a bit. Yeah, not by much. No, by a smidge. Yeah, yeah just just a little. You know, like a a percentage point or two. But still, I mean, that's going to help some teams right now that are like butt up against the salary cap. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So. Um, one of the biggest moves that I was surprised about, along with the Andy Dalton one, was a couple of the other moves that happened. Uh, the fact that Cam Newton was re-signed in New England. Now, we talked about this a little bit before the show, but we kind of understood why that would ha- why that would be a good fit for Cam Newton because they re-signed a couple of tight ends up there, you know what I mean? And, and they're starting to put some pieces up there for him to throw to. And he's a, a much cheaper option to get somebody, and plus he's already been a year in their system. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so that's why I like that move up there for them. Um, that's going to bode well for them. Tom Brady re-signed for Tampa Bay. Uh, uh, Gronkowski re-signed for Tampa Bay one year, $10 million. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, my gosh. Um, I have to say this because he's part of the, he was part of the Steelers. Uh, Bud Dupree. From the 8063, signed a big time contract with Tennessee Titans, uh, 35 million guaranteed, uh, five years, 85 million, uh, something yeah. like that. Um, he gets 35 million guaranteed. So good on you, my man. Um, you're going to see some guys from Pittsburgh not going to be re signed, even though they restructured Ben Roethlisberger's contract to save $15 million. There's too many guys on the team that need re-signed, plus the fact that you had Marquise Pouncey retired. Okay, we, we did not, quote-unquote, re-sign uh, Villanueva. He's talking to re- rejoin the team, but you're having a lot of teams restructure contracts to try to bring other players in. You know what I mean? Yep. And Pittsburgh's not the only one. Yeah, which is the only league that allows that. No other league, you just get cut or somebody, you get traded, something happens so you can have the cap. No other league allows restructuring other than the uh, NFL when it comes to deals like this. 
Yeah, you know, that's so, why you wonder why players piss off their teams to try to get money as early as possible. It's because they know their contracts are likely to be restructured later. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. You know. Exactly. But the the frenzy that's taken place. Uh, I, I would say the real quick the biggest signee, which was before the free agency even kicked off, which was something that didn't make much sense since he got the exact deal he wanted about five months ago. Uh, by the time they came to the the agreement was Dak agreeing to a four-year, $160 million deal. He wanted four years about five months ago. You wanted five years. Now, all of a sudden, you go, oh, we'll give him four years. This sounds great. It's like, well, what did you wait seven months for? Like, you should have just get like, – the, he wanted that as the season ended. He literally it was – Dak wanted four. Jerry wanted five. That was the disconnect. He didn't want the extra year. He wanted one less year of control, so he was going into the free agency at a year – less rather than a year gained so that's something that he has the um, ability to do if he wants and they finally agreed to a deal of that l that just made no sense to me just because it took so long to get the exact deal he wanted which could have happened so much sooner and with a lot less heartache for both sides i think uh, yeah Jones just wants the cowboys because they suck and never get as far as he wants them to get to on the field to be in the media spotlight, no matter what way it is, and that's why he prolonged that. So you know what? Do you know what? I I agree with you on that a hundred percent. But you know what else I think too? I think another reason why this went for as long as it did was because I think Jerry Jones was trying to see if he could land somebody like Tom Brady, or or somebody like that, and that's why he didn't want to commit to Dak Prescott. And now he doesn't have much of a choice. Because let's face it, after Andy Dalton signed, the next best QB in the free agent market was was Fitzmagic. Yeah, then you got uh, Ritzky. Yeah, you're not going to replace him with him, but you got the draft, and then you have to hope he comes in and does but, as good as Dak see, did. That's initially. what I'm talking about. Even if so, you get somebody in the draft, you can't expect a kid. To come right in and be what Prescott. No, yeah. you, you can't. But okay, so that's why I think that's this. Well, I think this Jerry, Dak Prescott deal got done now. I think Jerry was thinking because uh, Brady wasn't going anywhere after winning the Super Bowl in Tampa. I think he was thinking Deshaun is pissed with Tennessee or not Tennessee with Houston, the Texans, and Russ ain't too happy in Seattle. I think he thought he could have somehow finessed one of them out of their two locations. And that didn't work. So then he ended up getting Dak on what he wanted, which he could have settled for months ago. That, right? That's what I mean. That's why I think, yeah, yeah. I agree. I but agree with you 100%. It is interesting, though, since one guy that signed, I think it was for 12.5, I believe he was also on the Texans a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Tyrod Taylor's now on the Texans again. Um, so it's interesting to see that come down since he is similar. <laughs> In a in a running quarterback that is a game manager that can kind of do to a much less degree, but similar run a similar style offense that Deshaun ran. See, so if you're going to think about losing this battle to your quarterback and saying, "Listen, we're not going to win. He's going to win. He's already won. He's basically destroyed our entire PR because." which is deserved, by the way, Texans. You're a god-awful organization. Um, but Tell us how you really feel, Joe. He's destroyed their entire PR, rightfully so. And now they bring in Taylor, who's a similar poor man's backup version of running the same offense as a elite all-star of Watson does. So it seems like that could be a move admitting defeat before you officially admit defeat and go Tyrod Taylor might be the starter of the Houston Texans next year after Deshaun Watson has moved on for other assets. That seemed like a move that when here's a guy we can deal with being a one-year stayover that manages the team well, is a good guy in the locker room, always talked highly about, yeah. and then move on from him and get the assets needed. It just seems like a move that's pushing towards that direction more and more. You know, there's. I've been hearing a lot of rumblings about Wilson, Russell Wilson, kind of getting out of Seattle, and then we obviously know about Deshaun Watson. 
I'm going to be interested to see who gets Watson. Who's going to be the team that's going to pony up the money for that player? Okay, because assets, because you need a lot of assets. Oh, well, that's what I mean, because you're not going to be able to just go, oh, yeah, well, no. So which which teams out there have those kinds of assets? Obviously, teams that have draft picks, teams that have lots of salary cap space, things of that nature. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm going to be interested to see who's going to step into the breach for this Watson guy, because all 32 teams should be looking at this guy. All 32 teams should be calling this guy. Okay, seriously. I mean, uh, it's no joke. And, and the fact that we're talking about guys like Tyrod Taylor, uh, the fact that we're talking about guys like Jameis Winston, I, I, I'm sorry, but I just don't think these guys are starting quarterbacks. I think these guys are backups at best. Okay. And they are backups, but I think they're sold over back. There's backups that yeah, are you. good enough to start for a year to hold over your team. Or Foles for at least been for at least seven or eight games. Uh Foles has usually been one of them because he's never proven to be a starter. Um obviously he won a Super Bowl doing that one time. Um and then uh, Taylor hasn't already done anything done since. Yeah, Taylor's already done it on a couple teams in the past, including San Diego, which he kind of yeah. just got um, injured, and then Herbert stepped in quicker, and you weren't going to take him out after what he was doing. Um, no, because I so, like Justin Herbert in San Diego. That was a yeah, good pickup for them. Um, Dalton's at this point of his career is probably the same thing. I think that's what the Bears are thinking. They don't want to bank on Nick Foles, who's an injury prone guy. They want to have a guy that's been more of an Iron Man, even if he's not doing great stats wise. He just rarely gets banged up in Andy Dalton that for a probably eight to 10 game stretch can put together stats. But also, he is one of those weirdest quarterbacks of all time because when you look at his numbers, for the last decade from 2010 to 2020, he was one of the better passing yardage guys behind the Breezes and Brady, but never had the flashier overall numbers. So it's hard to peg really what the hell Andy Dalton is. He's all, he's like that most interesting man in the world, just Sackey's commercial, where it's just like he's the most interesting quarterback, where it's just like... What, what, um, I'm but, with you on that. I'm with you on that. But I, you have... I think you brought up a big key to the NFL, which is one of the biggest things of the offseason this far, and that's the Patriots um, with their offseason. They brought in all these guys so far. They brought in Hunter Henry, uh, def defender Carl Davis. Um, they brought in uh, Giannu Smith. That's the other guy, the other tight end. They brought in two good tight ends. Um, Pass rusher Matt good, Judon. Yeah, the good D tackle from the uh, Dolphins, who I always mispronounce his last name, Bear, but uh, Devon Godchuck, I guess is how you say that. Uh, but uh, he's a guy that they were talking about earlier on the radio that uh, he's been performing better as he, his last two seasons ascending. So that seems like a good pickup. Kendrick Bourne is a nice deep threat. Receiver, you added, you stole Jalen Mills from the Eagles, so screw you, Patriots. Um, and then uh, Nelson Aguilar went to them, who actually performed well for Oakland or Vegas. I mean, so D Devon Gouchet, or I'm sorry, Devon Gujo, Devon Gujo. Okay. They also are getting back Deontay Hightower, who opted out last year. Right, and they're also getting back Patrick Chung, both and got a uh, Ravens inside linebacker uh, Matthew Judon. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I mean. Oh, yeah, so, so they're getting these guys team back. Team they team also team. signed Nelson Aguilar, who actually did pretty decent for Vegas last year. Uh, so, uh, oh boy, I was surprised I, Henry got thirty-seven point five though, just because of injury. Hunter Henry's always been a good tight end. He's just been banged up. A yeah, lot. his availability is not there. Yeah, his you know availability's I mean? not always been there. Yeah. So here's the thing. Now we're gonna get. Uh, we're gonna try to have a pseudo. I guess we're gonna try to have a uh, normal football season. We're gonna try to have training camp start at the the regular time. And and I don't know if they're gonna do any 
uh, preseason games or not. I haven't heard anything about that. As I do know so far that the Hall of Fame game is supposed to still happen. Which as is of in, now. Okay. Yeah, as of now, which is in August. Okay, and that is a – that's like the first preseason game of all preseason games because that's yeah. at the beginning of August when they do the enshrinement. So um, they're – uh, if that game goes off, then they're going to probably play a couple. They'll probably play the full four games or something like that, you know. But Unless I haven't heard they change the preseason, which had, was in rumors after they didn't have it. Were they going to change it right. going forward to less games? Or exactly. They keep the thing? We'll have to see what that brings. Yeah, because I haven't heard anything. I haven't read anything. I haven't seen any, any reports on, on that. All I know is that the league date, the official league starts on the 17th. Um, any and all trades can happen beforehand, but nothing's official until the league um, starts yep. their year. Um, so all these moves are subject to um, yep. approval by the league. And then um, that's when fran uh, tran- franchise tags and transition tags are issued as well for each team. So each team is allowed to do that for, for a player or two. Yep. And then- well, a report just came in, speaking of signees, that Jacoby Brissett is going to the Dolphins on a one-year deal to kind of, I guess, be a similar, he's kind of a similar player to a Tua-esque athlete, just not as athletic, maybe to be a guy that's been around the block that can kind of help be in the quarterback room with a Tua signee. I think that's why the Eagles were also interested in Brissett. He has a connection with Sirianni, yeah. maybe would help a guy like Hurts just integrating into the nfl just like he can do with percent you know, what's really cool is that you get some of these guys and then these guys take these players under their wings and show them how to be professionals show them how to be in the league show them, you know that's what I mean? why fitzpatrick's still a quarterback in yeah, exactly yeah. <laughs> that's why he's getting 10 million dollars a year because he's a coach on the field <laughs> and then for like seven games turns into tom brady and then all of a sudden falls off the cliff yeah yeah, you know, has has 14 touchdowns in seven games, and then after that's got 25 interceptions. Like, wait a minute, what? What? No, no, no. The, he never he never plays long enough to get that many interceptions. He only gets like three or four, and then he's done. You know, after he throws three or four interceptions, then he's done for a couple of games until the next quarterback throws a couple of interceptions. So, yeah, I I think this year in the NFL is going to be more competitive because I think you're going to see uh, because everybody was so hesitant last year with the COVID and all that stuff. And, uh, and the fact that we're going to start seeing fans in the stands, you know what I mean? Um, so I think that's really going to change uh, the, the, the football landscape. You know, here's the thing that we learned about this whole COVID thing is that sports is non-essential. I mean, when you really break it down, it's they're really not. You know, the things that are essential are the, the people that are bagging your groceries, the truck drivers that are driving the food back and forth. You know what I mean? Those are the essential people. You know what I'm saying? So I, I hope, my hope is this, that these NFL players and the league and everybody else involved has a much more greater appreciation for the fan and for the fact that the fan – is spending their hard-earned money on this stuff. Okay? Yeah. I mean, when when you come out and you say, we're going to allow fans in the stands, and then you say, well, we'll sell tickets to the to season ticket holders. They get first crack. All right, cool. That's awesome. That's how it should be. However, if the face value of the ticket is $76, you shouldn't be charging them 1076 for that same ticket. You, you see what I'm saying? That that, yeah. that that doesn't fly with me at all. That does not fly with me at all. That's what the Flyers are doing. Yeah. The ticket holders I complained about that. The Flyers are charging like $500 for $200 seats or like 400 bucks for $100 seats or something like that. I don't like understand. That. Look, yeah. I understand that you're trying to recoup and all that and blah, 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 and I get it. But that's – I have a hard time with – 
NFL teams because they get so much money from their TV contracts and, and everything like that. Especially, and that, yeah, more so than hockey. Yeah. Okay, this is what I want to get into with you here, Joe, okay? Because the NFL, each team gets like $250 million. We sat down and figured it out one day, and each team gets like $250 million. Well, man, I'm here to tell you, $250 million, that, that pays for what? The the salary cap for the NHL right now is at eighty two point three million dollars, right? So two hundred fifty million would give you at least four three teams salaries right there. Yeah, all their full salary, the whole team. Okay, so the fact that the NHL is only getting about between three and six million dollars a year from their TV contracts, you see what I'm saying? Plus the fact that the NHL. If their fans are not in the stands, they're not making money because they don't have those TV contracts. When it's the exact opposite with the NFL, the NFL has these massive TV contracts. So any money that comes well, in the from NHL the game, some money they have TV, yeah, to the degree of the NFL, right? But what I'm saying is, is that if there's no fans in the stands in NHL, that hurts way more. Yeah. The bottom line of every NHL team, because that's where a lot of their revenue comes from, is those fans in the in the stands. Okay, that's not so in the NFL, where the NFL any of the concessions and all the gate goes to the ownership. Okay, Be- because they get so much money from the TV contracts that any of the gate money is all just ownership money. So the fact that you're charging. Six hundred percent more than what the tickets originally valued, so that you could try to recoup some money. Come on, I have a hard time with that. No, that's true. But I think uh, one of my wrap-up points on the NFL would be a team that's come in and surprised me this far in the free agency is Jacksonville because they've just traded for put reports uh, that came in thirty minutes ago. Malcolm Brown, the good D tackle from New Orleans. They also signed Marvin Jones per reports to two years, fourteen million, and brought in Griffin um, on a three-year deal. Nikhil Griffin and. Uh, also brought in Tyson Alayu, uh, who you have some familiarity uh, with at D-Tackle. So they seem to be building a team and brought in a Chris Mahertz, who I don't really know much um, about on a two-year deal. He's uh, known primarily as a blocking tight end, apparently. So he'll help with your uh, making your line even better as a blocking tight end. It seems like this team is either building – to draft their next guy or build around a game manager, which they already have, which would be Gardner Minshew. Because they're building the all the other guys other than Jones they got right now and Mahertz, who is a blocking tight end, who's more for protecting than he is anything in the offensive uh, facet. Um, oh, and then they agreed to terms with Philip Dorsett, too. So he's an offensive guy. It seems like you're either bringing in a team to build around Minshew who can just manage a roster well, and if you have that defense like it looks like Jacksonville's bringing up, he'll get to deep and you'll be able to go far like you saw the Bears do with a Rex Grossman X quarterback where Minshew's better than him. Rex Grossman was really nothing special. So it seems like Minshew might even be better than him. Grossman would make mistakes that you would go, why is this guy starting? Uh, yeah. But he was able to get but, the Bears. Minshew doesn't make those mistakes. Yeah. Trent Dilfer made mistakes where you would go, why is this guy starting? And he got the Ravens to the Super Bowl because of no, the he team didn't. around him. He was just on the team. Well, well no, he didn't get <laughs> there to get the Ravens to the yeah, Super Bowl. Yeah, okay, all right. Guys. All right, okay, okay. So, <laughs> he certainly didn't do much to help. That was pretty much the same with Rex Grossman, though. He was kind of just there and, and then just threw in the team's touchdowns most of the time. Right. Where Minshew usually probably has at least 20-something touchdown potential with the right squad. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. He missed some time because he was hurt a little bit this past year. But, you know, look, Jacksonville two years ago had one of the best defenses in the league. Okay. Yep. And and I, I don't know what happened down there, but it just seemed like something just kind of flew in the water and they just completely dropped off last year. Okay. Now they're coming back now with some more guys on the team and, you know, they're making some moves and, I've always liked the mustached one. I always thought he was a pretty good quarterback, but I agree. I think he's just basically a glorified game manager 
and he's a little bit better than the Rex Grossman's of the world and a little bit better than the Trent Dilfer's of the world because he doesn't make those mistakes, you know, and he is going to get you 25 or, to, you know, between 20 and 25 yeah, touchdowns I think for the year. Minshew's a guy that can win you a Super Bowl with the right team yeah. because he also contributes into it, where yeah. Grossman and Dilfer are just there as your team. They were on the play. roster. Yeah. Like, yeah, they were just on the roster. Like, <laughs> it's kind of like when you're a go- when you have a team in hockey that has such a good defense and defensive forward that makes a goalie that's never gotten a team deep into the playoffs before look like a million bucks getting to the cup, and it's probably not because of him. It's probably because of the fact that the team is absolutely loaded around him. Could be like Antti Antti Niemi's not a bad example of that. When he yeah. got there with Chicago, he was a solid goalie, but he wasn't anything miraculous, Gosh, and he yeah. put up miraculous numbers because of the team around exactly so exactly. i'm with you i'm with you um real interesting here the next 24 hours i think in football you're gonna i think we might see some of the like i think that deshaun watson domino is gonna fall um within the next couple of days because you want to get those guys in sooner rather than later especially now with covid and getting guys transferred and moved and changed over and all that, and get them into your facility as soon as yeah, possible. Yeah, I was surprised how quick that was with Car- because with Wentz that was quick for the Colts. It didn't take that long, so I'm not sure if that's as low of a process as people think. Because Wentz was in Indianapolis a couple of days later. Yeah, well, at the team facility. I think what's going to complicate things is the 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 what's what's going to be needed from Houston in return. I think that's going to complicate things and that's going to draw out this process a little bit more because you might have four or five teams calling up and saying, Hey, uh, what's the offer for, 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 you know, for Deshaun, what do you guys want? And they're going to be like, well, we need a first round pick. We need blah, blah, blah. And they're going to be like, all right, we'll we'll call you back. I mean, it's going to take a little, I think it's going to take a, a couple of days but I'm going to be interested to see, though, if if it happens in the next couple of days. Because if I was a team looking for that franchise quarterback to come in and be that guy like Deshaun Watson can be, I would want to be making that deal much sooner rather than later. No, that's true. That's a very good point. Yeah, that makes sense. You know. Now, I don't have a – that's pretty much until next week, my roundabout. Like I said, I wanted to wrap up with shouting yep. out the – Yeah, we're good, man. For now, the now we get to hit him out of the park now. Yeah, yeah. Um, did we have to run the ad again, or are we just run? No, we're good. We're good. Only run it once. Okay. Yep. Um, when it comes to baseball, we're obviously getting close to the season coming and drawing near for all of these teams. Um, it's going to be interesting uh, what teams are really able to stand up and stand out. The Yankees have been good in the preseason this far at 11-4. Yeah. And, and then Kansas City, who made a lot of moves in the offseason to try to be competitive in their division, that is not as competitive as it once was due to teams getting rid of players, has had the best preseason at 12-3. and three. Um, It's going to be interesting to see. I think Kansas City has the chance – to be a sleeper team in baseball. It's all going to depend on their pitching. Uh, they're, I have a question for you. I have a question goals. for you. Do they, they don't normally play this many preseason games, do they? They might have started a bit early this year. Usually they would. This is how it used to be. We used to always start in April. Then they pushed it to March 20th to start seasons, and then the preseason would start in February more so like it did in years past. So Well, the end of February is when pitchers and catchers reported. Mm-hmm. Right? But this year they're starting back on the old school, like a couple of years ago schedule starting the season at the beginning of April. Okay, but so they normally play this many preseason games? Yeah, normally it would be around this much, yeah. In past years, I think it might have been cut a bit because they would start end of February, go to about the middle of March. And then have- so they play 20 preseason games? Because in baseball, it takes a while. You have to get the pitchers back into their groove so they don't get injured. And then hitters usually take a little bit. Because a pitcher is all about feel. A hitter is about feel. And then one being able to hit a circular ball with a circular cylinder. So 
that's the, that takes a little bit to get back into that stride and you feel uncomfortable where your elbows at to where unless if every day which i don't think most people do this you're going in your backyard practicing your state like people have great work ethics but normally every day you're not going to see somebody if you live next to a baseball player going like this in their front yard and well, it's if, like if that baseball it's like, player yeah, was right, jerry what you doing over there like, that, oh, hey, Rick, I'm practicing my stance again. It's like, you did that five times a day already. Yeah, I figured I would do it for the sixth. It's like, oh, okay. Um, like, if you live next door to Jerry Rice and he was playing baseball and you see him out there practicing his stance, you're like, oh, okay, that's Jerry Rice out there. Okay, I got you. I mean, you know, I, I'm just asking because it just seems like a lot of preseason games, and then they're going to play a full season this year, correct? Uh, close to it, yeah. I think they decided, I believe it was 156. So they so, normally play 164. Yeah, uh, 162. 162. So they've only shortened it by five or six games? Why bother? I, I think that was because of when the season... Um, oh. And hold on, let me see. I'm trying to remember... Yeah. Um what it is for this year um because it was either they were going to keep it at 162 or shorten it to around the 156 um spring training uh opening day all 30 teams Major League Baseball announced the 2021 regular season on July 25th. Okay. Uh, okay, it says a full... Well, that that's an old announcement, though, so I don't know. All right, well, so let's look at the... 150... Piece. Short on the proposal. This is 154 for this. Okay. One. okay. My, my, my point is this. It's either 156 or 154, I think. Okay. Okay, well, you know, um, I don't understand why they're doing it like that, but okay. I think it's because if it is shortened, it, it does what the NHL did where it allows a week's time because you started in April instead of March. Okay. So it allows extra time if COVID does affect teams like it is in the NHL um, and having long layoffs to be able to make it up rather than be stuck and be in November by the time yeah, you yeah. start the postseason because it took so long. Right. Okay. Which so now this year shouldn't be as big of a deal if that happens because everything's supposed to be pretty peachy keen. Uh, I mean, but, you know, right. But, but we don't know. Yeah. So, you would so are they allowing extra players on the teams like taxi squads and stuff like that? Baseball adjusted the roster a couple of years ago up one to begin with. So as far as I know, they're just keeping it at 26 this year. Okay. Because the 20, because now um, expanded in um, September is only 28 compared to a full 40. Okay. I thought the better idea would have been let them keep the 28 man roster until everything goes more back to normal with vaccinations and things tamper. Maybe like for the first month allow it to be 28, then go back to 26, but they didn't do that. So it, it is what it is. Okay. Know? Okay. Uh, I was just curious as to that. You know what I mean? Um, do you think, do you think that uh, the Dodgers can repeat? They definitely have the team to be able to do it. Um it's going to be interesting because uh, you obviously made your team stronger. I mean, when you bring in Trevor Bauer and you already had a very good rotation, that's definitely going to help you. Um, I think the Padres got a lot better as well, so they'll be able to contend with them. Uh, you got teams around the league that have got significantly better. Uh, Oakland's always a tough team to play out there when they have the battle of California. I don't. I think they're slated to play this year. I haven't looked at every team's schedule, but they're a team that usually uh, can give them some fits. You have to battle Atlanta's of the world, who I think are going to be able to match up with the Dodgers fairly well. They can repeat, but it's not going to. They have one of the harder roads to repeat because everyone – and the NL East is now went from one of the divisions that people didn't like watching to a couple of years 
to now being one of the more competitive divisions where all the Braves, Nationals, and Mets, um, and somewhat the Phillies, but more those three, are contenders for uh, being able to get deep into the playoffs. And I would say off the surface, the Mets and Braves are contenders for the World Series because the Nationals have to rebound from their hangover last year. Which yeah. <laughs> so, um, that that's, um, that's why I think it's going to be tough. But could they? Yes. But I don't think they're likely to. I would say I'll put it at like a 60 okay. percent chance, which is still a good chance. But then you have other teams with 40 Right. Whoever's coming. So the Battle of California is the Athletics and Yo, know, you got you got a lot of teams in California. You okay, well athletics. Well, they are playing the Dodgers, they're playing the Angels. Yeah. Uh they're playing Dodgers, them in the first month. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah, okay. All right. I, I, I just wanted to see what, what the chances of them. Now, look, I'm going to go Homer on us now. How are the Phillies looking this year? Um, they're looking all right. They just don't make the – like, they look good. Some of their guys look real good. Other guys look, I guess, more statistically average, I guess might be the way to put it. Um, but I think, all in all, Eflin, the guy that they want to really emerge as the third starter, has been their best pitcher this far in the, the okay. staff. So that's helpful coming in. Uh, Nola, you would like to see better numbers from. He's honestly been kind of off uh, to start spring training. But some guys just use spring training as a kind of a get-together type thing. <laughs> uh, like, let me kind okay. of get a feel. Like, let me get a feel for my pitches, and then I'll really start bringing it in the regular season. Right. There's a chance maybe he's one of those guys that just does that. Um, you would definitely like to see more, but I think they're doing all right. It's not okay. – they're not doing bad. It's just – there's team – like their center fielding job is competed between Kingery, who looks like he has a better approach coming off of a bad battle with COVID. And I believe in Kingery still. I think he'd be a solid player. But he's not performing to the level of what Moniac was, who you picked in the first round um, years ago uh, out of high school when other guys got picked in that draft that are already in the majors. So if he's performing and showing up, you should be 100% making sure he's getting put in center field yeah. uh, for your lineup so people can – see him as much as possible where they keep putting in Herrera, they keep putting in Kingery who has a better approach, but it's not translating yet to the consistency uh, when it comes to average and everything. You would want to see more of him, which it doesn't make a lot of sense because another guy I really like that I think could be the Brock Holt of the Phillies, Girardi kind of talked about it a bit, is Nick Maton that okay. they got in the seventh round in 2017. He can kind of slap the ball around the field and field all the infield positions. He's hitting 286, and that's 21 at-bats. They keep giving him pretty much as much opportunity as they can. And then one of their top prospects in Mickey Moniak, who got picked in the first round, now it's up to 18, but before this game he had 15 to 21 wow. ABs. He's supposed to be one of your top prospects compared to a guy that's supposed to be potentially a very good platoon player. Yeah. So what am I missing here? Like what? Like what? What are what? <laughs> like what are we doing with the way we're putting our life? And then and then they have and then they have. Um, I know you're not the biggest fan of um, everybody on ESPN, but I think this is the right time to pull a Stephen A. Smith moment here and go. You guys really had the savvy and the unmitigated gall to put Mickey Moniak in when you worked on television. <laughs> you put him in the game that was not broadcasted. Everyone's wanted to see him, and you have the audacity to say, yeah. oh, okay, everyone wants to see him. Let's just put him in the game that everyone can only listen to on the radio. It's like... No, I don't even think it was on the radio, actually. I don't even think this game was available for audio, actually. I don't even think this game was available for anything. Oh, against, my gosh. Well. Or against the Blue Jays that we got smoked 14-5, to 5, so it was a yeah, good right. thing it wasn't available for anything. But either way, yeah. 
th- you have the audacity to put him in when nobody's watching, nothing's on, and everyone's wanted to see him all preseason. Exactly. That just doesn't make any sense. Exactly. This is this is <laughs> just a team that do, I don't think it's I don't know if it's just ownership doesn't keeps having the don't rush people mentality because Dombrowski um, should be stepping in as a more experienced GM saying, hey, Joe, if a guy's hitting this well as a top overall pick from a few years ago, why ain't he in the sorting line? Hey, you know. Because <laughs> well, number one, here, nobody folks. wants to do If you look at polls around the city, I understand you want to give people second chances, but you also have to look at what your fans want. Yeah. Nobody wants Odubel Herrera making the opening day roster. So if you put him on the opening day roster, you're just asking for less people to show up. It's time to <laughs> don't do it. that. that you, you're just automatically from the forefront saying, we don't care about your opinion. Yeah. We're going to do what we need to do. And that's right. something that other teams in the city have kind of had before. It seemed like the Sixers were doing it at times during the rebuild. And then it seemed like the Flyers were doing it at times with homegrown. And look where that got them. They would have people wanting to – berate the they, they people would be going nuts about it so that just doesn't work you got to yeah. be straight forward and you got to yeah. listen to the fans that's what the flyers seem to have got better at doing when hextall came in since he knows the fans he used to play for the team and then fletcher kept a similar um realm and now yeah, he'll, he'll he'll was doing listen, the same things yeah he used to listen and trades for a damn defenseman but that's a different story um the Don't philly started just play the guys that are supposed to be in. Get them continuous ABs. Modiac should be one of those guys. I don't know why they're not playing him more. That's my only gripe against it, because otherwise I've liked how Girardi has really talked guys up and said, look, this guy's got great stuff. He's coming off of a year that he was injured or a year that he was blah, 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 yeah. whatever it was that X player. Girardi's a good motivator and a good talker that he just knows how to put somebody in the very comfortable situation where it's like, look, I've studied you. I've watched this. I've had my different guys study what you do best. And I think blah, 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 blah would make you get to the best of your ability. Well, Chase Anderson, it seems like he's mixing in. Well, he talked about how much he likes our new pitching coach that I like in Cotham. He's one of our best pitchers in spring training. In three games, he's 2-0 and in seven innings with eight strikeouts and didn't give up a run yet. So right. he seems like a very good addition. Um, if he can locate his stuff better, Sam Coonrod from the um, Giants, who um, maybe we can get from Gabe and uh, kind of have some payback to people that uh, don't like Kapler um, stealing some of <laughs> has looked good at a 2.25 with four strikeouts and four innings. Um, so uh, Spencer Howard as well, one of our top prospects. Uh, he looked a little bit off in his last outing to bring his ERA up, but still has a .67 whip with a six ERA. So that's only because of one bad outing when you look at the numbers like that. One bad inning out of his three innings. So he's looked pretty good yeah. this year. It's looked like he yeah. has oomph, where last year coming off of an injury, you saw it. You saw the effects of it where this year it looks like he's getting back to what he was supposed to be. So it seems like their staff is coming together and their pitching staff will be more fluent this year. Vince Velasquez, for God's sakes, is actually pitching well to start spring training. You know, so last year I remember a lot of the a lot of the issues you had was because of the bullpen. And a lot of the problems that you had with with them was because of that particular reason. It seems like they've gone out and addressed that this offseason. Yeah, most of the guys they signed uh, were either, and sometimes they got certain guys that they had no business getting, like Brandon Kinster or minor league deals who were easily going to make the team, guys like that. Like they had no business finding a way to get those guys on um, pretty much uh, cheap deals. Yeah, cheap deals that they didn't even like. You got you brought in Brian Mitchell too, who um, is a guy that's been a journeyman in his entire career. Got picked by the Yankees in '09. He's actually looked solid in six games. He has a 4.05. He looks like a guy you might be able to throw in the minors and maybe kind of get his stuff going a little bit more. You brought in one of the better lefties in Tony Watson somehow in a minor league deal. That's what Dabrowski would you have. He's not looking as good in spring, but some guys that are veterans. Yeah. They look, I've watched interviews where veterans never have. Some guys just don't have great spring stats, and then they just hit it in the season. 
It's because when you watch an interview, they say, I don't use sprint training other than for feeling. I want to get the feeling of my pitches back. If I get hit around, that's fine because I'm just focusing on yeah, he's not really, feeling yeah. the best I can feel for opening day. And then I'm going to really bring it because I don't want to get caught up in feeling and movement and then injure myself. So usually okay. some guys that are veterans take it more tempered. We'll have to see if he makes it, but um, I really like that. I also like that our manager's a catcher because those guys tend to be the guys that know the game the most. They've seen the whole field. They're looking out to the whole field all the time. They're managing while playing. They're the guy that's managing the game the whole time in their head while being an active player. That's going to help a lot of our young catchers. We have Rafael Marcon, Rodolfo Duran. Girardi seems to already be obsessed with just like he is with Marcon. Um, pretty much if you're a catcher and you do something, Joe Girardi's going to like you. Um, and then, Can't go uh, wrong with that. Yeah, so you have Knapp is performing his best since Girardi came in, who was supposed to be a better performer of a former second-round pick that then didn't do much. So it seems like everything's moving in the right direction. The Phillies' biggest issue is their division. Their division's loaded with the Braves and Mets, especially are the Nationals going to stay healthy and come back? or the Mets going to stay healthy? Because that's their biggest issue all the time as well. The Braves have been usually the healthier of all those bunches. And then will the Phillies be able to ascend and take advantage if teams do get banged up, or will they have the same issues and flaws come out that have come out in years past? Be interesting to see, that's for sure. Uh, I, I think maybe I understand now why they made this season a little bit shorter was for exactly what you were talking about, so that they could, if there was a COVID outbreak, they could rearrange and postpone and change games and you know change the schedule around a little bit. That gives them a little bit of flexibility where, you know, they they don't they're not right up against a, a specific number of games, so that makes more sense as far as that's concerned. I'll tell you what, man. Uh, we got a lot of sports covered. We got a lot of things covered. Um, a lot of things going on right now in sports. Um, you're going to have March Madness starting up here real soon. Uh, we didn't give any. We didn't even get a chance to talk about any college basketball because that's been kind of rolling. Uh, they're going to do a little bubble, I think, there for that, aren't they? Yeah, I think. Yeah. It's Where's the bubble in Florida? I think that's where it's going to be. Yeah. It's going. I think it's either going to be there or another place. They might have it in Texas. I think. Oh, Texas, okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. There's no. I don't know anything about that. So we didn't even get a chance to talk about that. But uh, I would like to say first of all, I'd like to thank our sponsor, um, www.cccresorts.com. That's the Canine Country Club Resorts. Uh, they are a uh, sponsor here for the Steel Flyers All Sports Network. Um, they take care of all of your pets daycare needs. They've got professional groomers on site. Uh, they have you can board your dog there for multiple days and you can just have a day daycare there or an hour daycare there. You can also do swimming. Uh, they have an indoor and an outdoor salt filtered pool so it doesn't affect the dog's skin. Check them out. They're our sponsor, www.cccresorts.com. Thank you very much for their sponsorship. Appreciate that very much. Joe, this has been a blast, man. Yep. Yeah, awesome doing the second show. We got to cover some great baseball. I'm telling you, um, man, we got a lot of stuff the, going. Now, the one thing the Phillies might have going for them this year is what got them going on a hot streak before their pitchers faltered when Kaplan was in town was the lux of the bamboo magic of Brad Miller. Well, there well, you go. Not the boys, but the boy is back in town. Okay. Brad Miller's back. There you go. Bringing, hopefully, bringing Heard his it here first. magic back. <laughs> and now we have the pitching to not fall on our face in September, hopefully. So, there you yeah. go. Sounds yeah. like a winner. A um, lot of things going on with the NFL, especially with the league um, starting their official uh, league date starts on the 17th. So this was the free start of the free agent frenzy. I, I don't think we're done. I think we're going to start. We're going to see some more moves for that, as for sure. Uh, the the NHL has definitely hit the halfway mark, and 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 more teams you're starting to see are breaking away from the pack. And, and the same thing is happening, I think, in basketball as well, too, where you're starting to see those top teams are starting to separate themselves now. And we're going to start getting into playoffs here real soon. Uh, it's going to be real interesting to see some of that. Um, thanks very much, Joe, for having me, man. Really appreciate it. Um, this is Awesome Sauce. You can catch all of our great stuff on www.steelflyers.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at steelflyers52.
thousand hour and 